Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a male clerk in a hire company and a woman customer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello. Welcome to Harry's Hire Company. How can I help you? Oh, hi. Yes. I've come in to find out about renting stuff for a 21st birthday party. Yes, of course. First of all, what date is the party? It's next Saturday. That was the closest we could get to the actual birthday, which is the 22nd of November. Gosh, it's hard to believe it was 21 years ago. Seems like yesterday. So the 18th of November? No, sorry. I meant the following Saturday, the 25th. OK. We have just about everything here. Tableware, marquees, you name it, we rent it. What size of event are we talking about here? Yes, that's a good question. We were planning to have about 40 people, but you know how these things grow, and it went up to 60 at one stage. Um, I think it's back to 55 now. Yes, that's right. It was all getting a bit out of hand. OK. And what kind of catering and entertainment are you having? We can help with entertainment hire too. You know, if you need microphones or a sound system. Oh, that's good. We've booked a catering company and they're providing a meal. It's nothing elaborate, just finger food snacks and then a simple buffet meal. So we'll need all the usual dinner plates and bowls. I suppose five dozen of everything. Oh, and knives and forks too. Five dozen sets. We won't need any cooking equipment because the caterers will do that. And they're providing tea and coffee as well. I see. And do you need any tables or chairs? Well, not tables because we wouldn't have room for them. But I suppose some extra chairs might come in handy. What type do you have? Come over here and I'll show you. We have a couple of different kinds. We do have the folding wooden ones like these, but the most popular ones are just those stackable plastic garden chairs. We rent a lot of those. Yes, the plastic ones look great. Maybe 40 of those. OK. I'm making a list here as we speak. Was there anything else? Oh, do you want small or medium glasses? People generally want both sizes. Yeah, better get both kinds. Four dozen of each. Um, and what else? The caterers are supplying a punch bowl, so that's OK. Oh, I know. What about six ice buckets for keeping the drinks cold? We're providing all the drinks because I have a friend who's helping us with that. Um, I suppose this is going to get very expensive. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Well, let's talk about our packages and rental deals. Firstly, what day do you want to collect the equipment? Oh, I'm not sure. Does that make a difference to the price? Well, the weekend package deal is to pick up after 5pm on Friday and drop off before 10am on Monday. That will be $1,600 plus tax. If you want to save a bit of money, you can collect the equipment on the day of the party before 5pm and drop off on the Monday before 10am and that will be $1,350 plus tax. That's called the same day package. Your party numbers come between our small and medium price packages, I'm afraid. So in fact, you could rent a few extra of everything for the same price. I see. Well, we're not inviting more guests. 
I think we have quite enough already. Um, are there any other hidden charges with those packages? No, not really. But if you want us to drop off and pick up at your house, there is an extra home delivery charge of fifty dollars, provided you live within ten kilometers of here. Oh, and if you want to take out breakage insurance, that's a sixty dollar flat fee. Otherwise, you pay for every item you break at the replacement cost. Wow! So how much is that then? I bet that soon adds up. Well, yes, it does a bit. Let's see. Tableware is three dollars fifty-five a piece. Small glasses are three dollars fifty, and medium glasses are four dollars forty. Oh, and if you break a chair, they're expensive, fifteen dollars each. And you'll be surprised what happens when the party gets going. Yes, insurance sounds like a good idea. And I think I'll take the weekend package deal. Thanks. It's much more convenient, isn't it? And not much more expensive. Okay. So let's take a few details then. Your name? Oh, it's Susan Millins. Um, is that Miller? No, it's M I L L I N S. Right. And your address, please. Twenty-eight B Sandstone Close, Martinsborough. And just to confirm the order. The medium-sized party weekend package with breakage insurance. And did you want to collect this yourself? Yes, thank you. I do live within ten k's, but I don't want to pay any extra charges. I'll get my son to help me. Okay. We'll need an emergency contact number just in case anything goes wrong. Oh, and credit card details, of course. Oh yes, of course. The phone number is zero eight four three nine eight seven six nine five. Okay, thank you. And now the credit card. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to a group of tourists who are visiting a cave in Vietnam. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our visit to one of the most famous caves in Vietnam. As you know, this cave is famous for its wildlife, and one of the creatures you will observe in here is the small cave cockroach. They live mostly on the bird and bat droppings that are so plentiful in the caves. The guardrails along the trails are covered with these droppings, and this makes a feast for the cockroaches. So be careful where you put your hands; they will not harm you, but it can be a shock if you touch them. Once you are in one of the main caves, look out for the green centipedes. They will not be on the trail, but can often be seen on the wall close by. They feed on other insects and are fascinating to look at because of their colour. And of course, there are many legs. Please, please do not try to pick one up, though. These centipedes have a very nasty, poisonous bite. There are also deep red millipedes. These have a fully rounded shape, and they look like a streamlined, elongated train with a hundred or so closely packed legs extending right and left. When you get to the large, high caves. You should look right up above you for the swifts and bats. The bats in this cave are mostly a type of dwarf bat, which are common in this part of the world. They will be clustered high up against the walls, maybe a hundred or two hundred together. They look like shadows high on the walls of the cave. They are likely to be very quiet right now. 
But because there are so many of them together, you will have no difficulty identifying them. They sleep all day until they all leave the cave in a massive flock on their nightly hunt for flying insects. The swifts are the creatures you can see flying around during the day, especially if they have young ones to feed. They can navigate in the darkness here and will fly outside in ones and twos at dusk to catch small winged insects like mosquitoes. However, they tend to return before it's pitch black outside and they do not hunt at night. The swifts make nests, usually higher up on the ceiling of the cave. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The paths tend to run around the edges of the large caves. Mostly this is because the centre is a mound of guano, the bird and bat droppings. This is also the source of the strong smell inside the caves. You may not like this smell, but the locals know its economic value. They have harvested the products of these caves for centuries. The guano is very valuable as fertilizer, and so it's collected each year, once the young birds have grown and the swifts have abandoned their nests. The guano is not the only valuable byproduct of the wildlife here. As you travel through the caves, you will notice some bamboo structures. These very flimsy-looking sets of poles that go a full hundred metres right up to the roof, are what the locals climb up to gather the swifts' nests. These are even more valuable than the guano, as they are the main ingredient in bird's nest soup. Before you begin, it's time for some safety instructions. As you probably know, this is a huge limestone cave that goes about one kilometre back into the hills, and in places it's a hundred metres in height, and 300 metres wide. There's no need to crawl around in here as you do in other caves, but it's dark inside, of course. That's why I insisted you bring a working light. Please check that it shines brightly, and ensure that you stay together with others who have a good torch. In one of the larger areas of the cave, the roof is pierced so some sunlight will get through. It is best to turn your torches off if you can see well and save your batteries. It's a good idea to put your waterproof jacket on now. The walls may be wet, but that's not the main reason for the jacket. The bats and birds do excrete, and they are above you, so just in case. And of course, your hat or hood also keeps you safe from animal droppings. It's not advisable to use the guardrails as handholds. There are lots of droppings on those rails, and don't forget the cockroaches. You absolutely must follow the marked trails. The guardrails on either side are put there so that you cannot mistake them. We take no responsibility for your safety if you go over or under the rails into other cave areas. Keep your torches shining on the path whenever you are moving, just to be sure of your footing, and don't try to go too fast. You might trip, and you will certainly miss some of the fascinating wildlife in the cave. Now, it's time to begin the tour. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear a conversation between a student called Mary and her tutor, Mr. Hadstone. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 
to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Mr. Headstone. Is this the right time for our meeting? Yes, it is. Thanks for coming in at such a late hour, Mary. I know you've had a busy day studying and will be keen to get home. And thanks for volunteering to run this project. It's going to help you develop and practice skills needed by teachers today. Field trips are getting more and more a part of school life. So as a student of education, it'll be wonderful training for you. It's really a great opportunity. We did loads of field trips at school, so I've got a good idea of what sort of things we could do. Hmm, I expect so. But we're here to go through the basics of planning one, and the trip leader carries a load of responsibility. Right now, you're focusing on activities, but your main job is to consider the dangers and come up with ways of countering or avoiding them. There are lots of government regulations you won't have been aware of on your school trips, but they're just a guideline for your own planning. Some of those school trips you went on would have been pretty adventurous, right? Yeah. Okay, and your plan needs to be tailored to the kind of trip you're doing. On a well-planned and successfully led adventure trip, we don't often hear of problems, even though sometimes there's bad weather, for example, that a, that a school party has managed to combat. That's because the leader created a well-thought-out hazard management plan. Ah! Oh, I thought I'd just be taking my mates out on a trick. Now it's all paperwork. Yes, well, that's why I called you in. We'll work on this together over the next few days. I just wanted to give you a heads-up on what you'll need to think about. There are some aspects that every trip needs to consider. What do you think they might be? Uh, well... Heavy rain, or high winds, I guess, and any dangers in the terrain? Yes, we call those the significant factors. And another important one is the makeup of your group. But you don't need to go overboard. There are some kinds of hazard that you won't need to think about at all. Things like hurricanes, earthquakes, radioactivity, or major diseases such as cancer. The official name for those is unlikely events, because they almost certainly won't happen. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Okay, so let's consider the hazards seen as most likely on a field trip into the countryside. Weather causes real problems. Overexposure to the sun or the cold, even the wind, can have a big impact. And, of course, the weather can change very suddenly and without warning. Yes. People can get into trouble in the hills if they don't bring extra layers of clothes and a jacket, even if they start walking on a hot day. Oh, and a raincoat too, of course. Um, what's next then? Well, let's think about possible activities and what you might need. Yes, OK. Well, for hiking, of course, we need a first aid kit. Oh, and a decent topographic map of the area. And we need to make sure that more than one person can read it. I've run into lots of difficulties in the past with people who can't identify even major features, like rivers. And some people have no idea about contour lines. Ah, uh, And I suppose a compass, too. You'd need to list those. Then there are things that might be obvious, but must be written down and considered seriously. For example... If there's a possibility of falling more than two and a half meters, that's considered life-threatening. And I'm sure you would be aware of problems near the sea, like 
tides or high waves. And the trouble you can get into where there's a possibility of an avalanche or a mudslide or a flash flood if you're anywhere near rivers. Yes. Well, I was thinking of an adventurous route for this trip. You know, that's always more fun. And it's such a cool feeling when you've achieved something really difficult. Yes, okay, but then you need to consider who's going to be in your party. Don't go and plan things that are beyond the reach of most people or you're asking for trouble. You need to take into account the physical strength and experience of the party as a whole. When you make your groups, make sure there's at least one person in each one who's been hiking a few times before. Wow! There's a lot to write down, isn't there? I'm really keen to get started now. Well, good, because there's a lot more detail to consider. For now, I'll just mention two more of the common hazards for high school trips in particular. Yes? The Ministry of Education website says don't use inexperienced volunteers and don't allow student drivers to bring their own cars or to drive anyone else's car for that matter. Well, now I really have something to think about. Thanks, Mr. Headstone. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk on cochlear implants. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The topic for today's lecture is cochlear implants, which are a relatively new form of technology for assisting people who are profoundly deaf. First, let's revise how normal hearing works. If you look at image 1, you will remember that the ear has three sections. The outer ear, or pinna, picks up sounds which are then channeled through the ear canal to the eardrum, where they are transformed into mechanical vibrations. These are sent to the cochlea, or inner ear. Inside this snail-shaped tube, there are sensory hearing cells that have a variety of functions. The outer hair cells make soft sounds louder and reduce the volume of louder sounds. The inner ear cells transfer this information to the auditory nerve and thence to the brain which interprets the input as sounds. This sophisticated and sensitive process allows us to process a huge variety of auditory input. For those who are profoundly deaf, the system functions poorly or not at all, and the brain does not receive the input it needs to process and interpret sounds. Image 2 shows how a cochlear implant works. You can see that the implant has three main parts. The first external part, behind the ear itself, is the microphone, and at the back of this you can see its associated speech processor, which is a tiny computer. This analyzes and digitizes sounds and sends them to the transmitter, which is worn on the head. Those sounds need to be converted into electrical impulses so that they can be sent to the cochlea. If you look carefully at the image, you can see that just under the skin, directly behind the transmitter, is a surgically implanted receiver. This receives the sounds from the transmitter. 
It converts these sounds into electrical impulses, which are sent directly to an electrode array that is implanted inside the cochlea itself, thus completely bypassing the ear canal. As you have seen, a cochlear implant does not operate in the same way as the ear, nor, in fact, as a hearing aid. In cases of mild hearing loss, hearing aids can be very helpful. They simply amplify the normal sound waves as they travel down the ear canal. However, they generally cannot overcome severe hearing difficulties, and this is where cochlear implants come into play. So, what are the pros and cons of using a cochlear implant? Well, firstly, cochlear implants can deliver significant improvements in hearing for some users, and some people report dramatic improvements in the perception of individual words and sentences over the weeks and months after an implant. However, a cochlear implant is not a magic bullet that works equally well for all users. The sound signals that the brain receives from an implant are quite different from normal ones and this means that the user has to relearn how to hear. Many users report that speech sounds robotic after a cochlear implant, and the degree to which people can adjust to this new kind of hearing varies hugely with each user and situation. It is important to understand that a cochlear implant is not a cure for deafness and that the user is still deaf. Especially for a child, an implant is a long-term commitment involving lengthy and intensive training. The user must learn to reinterpret sounds and will likely need to augment this with speech therapy so that people in the community can easily communicate with them. The implants work much better in quiet situations than in noisy ones, so they still need to learn to lip-read and to use sign language. The surgery itself is not without risk, though it has greatly improved since it was first performed and there is some possibility of damage to facial nerves. Another disadvantage of a cochlear implant is that the surgery may remove any natural hearing that the deaf person still retains. This takes away the possibility of using a hearing aid should the implant not be effective. For this reason, many users have implant surgery performed on only one ear, the one with the least natural hearing. So. Who is best suited to receiving an implant? Many factors impact on this decision. The most significant one appears to be the duration of the deafness. And, as you would expect, those who have been deaf for a long time generally have lower success rates. The second related factor is how old the patient was when they became deaf, and maybe more significantly, whether they had learned to speak before they became deaf. Those who become deaf postlingually generally have better outcomes. Another factor is the health and structure of the cochlea and how many nerve cells the user retains. This is related to the cause of the hearing loss, and recent research is exploring how the spinal ganglion or nerve cells are affected by disease. Four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.